Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. I uh, hope you had a good couple of days, and I hope you're ready to continue with bioengineering and cyborgs and neurobiology and stuff like that, because we're going to be we're going to be doing some more of that. Um, hopefully, some more interesting stuff uh, on the horizon with that. Anyway. Um, On Monday, we went over well, actually a fair amount of stuff. Uh, we talked about transistor counts. There's a what? What are you uh, What are you referring to? Oh, in Virginia? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Huh. Who knew? Looks like it... Where, uh, where do you live? I don't know where that is. I hope everything's okay, though. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I hope you, uh, hope you're all right. Um, you know, obviously, if you need to get off or whatever in order to be safe, then don't hesitate. You don't even have to let me know. Uh, I understand. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, apologies, got a little... I lost my train of thought there. Uh, we went over transistor counts and how you know they've they've roughly doubled over every year and a half to two years thanks to Moore's law, uh, and it's been a long time talking about the the restrictions that exist because of it, uh, how we're hitting a theoretical wall, uh, and then how information technology, namely Moore's law, has affected. Uh, other branches of science because uh, of the ability to do computations faster than people normally can um, and analyses and stuff like that things like that then we went over cyborgs uh, so the difference between cyborgs and robots um, the history of cyborgs uh, some notable people and inventions on the horizon, and I believe that's that's actually where um, where I ended it. The last thing we talked about was the artificial kidneys, sort of. Not really. I just sort of mentioned that they were a thing, um, but they do what kidneys normally do, which is filter toxins from blood, and um, it allows patients to. go out and do things um, rather than being stuck on a dialysis machine because a dialysis machine is something that already exists. Um, it's just you are in a hospital um, and you can't you know, move away from the dialysis machine. Now we're going to talk a little bit about nervous system structure and function. So things specifically, well, specifically neurobiology, essentially. Um, 
Let's see here. We'll skip the video. So the nervous system receives sensory input, it interprets it, and then it sends out appropriate commands, or nervous systems, I suppose. Um, there is the central nervous system and the peripheral, peripheral nervous system. Good Lord, sometimes. Peripheral nervous system. Uh, let's see here. But yeah, uh, it's important to note that um, by and large, the nervous system has three sort of functions. It takes in sense, sensory input, takes in input from your senses, smells, sights, tastes, um, feelings, sounds, things like that. It gets processed in your nervous system, and then it sends a response out along the uh, motor portion of your um, nervous system in order to affect some sort of response from your body, whether it's like you hear a loud noise and you flinch, or you see a, a ball coming at you so you move your arm to catch it, or you you know taste something gross so you spit it out, or whatever. Um, that's the whole point of the nervous system is to take in input and turn it into output. And this sounds like a lot of what, you know, your brain does, and it is, it is, it's a lot of what your brain does. A lot of your life is taking an input and responding to it and, and turning it into output. However, um, it's different a lot of times for people because, um, well, well, we'll get into that, we'll get into that. So you've got... Here's an example of um, sort of the uh, the life cycle of a nervous system response. Uh, in this example, um, you know, the have you ever gotten the test from the doctor, the reflex test, where they hit your knee with uh, with a little mallet? Like I know that's a thing that exists in cartoons too, but uh, it is actually a thing that's done in real life. A couple people. Okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, the entire point of that is it actually, um, it's meant to, that little hammer is not just meant to hit your knee, it's actually meant to hit a specific nerve in your knee. Um, sort of like uh, eliciting a similar response that you get when you're, when you're, when somebody like tickles somebody else, you know? It's a it's an activation of those nerves that causes them to fire. So what happens is the sensory receptor picks up on it, it sends a signal uh, through your nervous system, and it goes through your peripheral nervous system first because your peripheral nervous system is basically everything uh, that's not your spine and your brain. Um, your central nervous system is your spine and your brain. Uh, your peripheral nervous system is all of like the the sensory input and, and motor output that exists in like your uh, your limbs and um, you know various spots on your on your your torso and things like that but it's not your it's not your spinal cord in your brain uh, anyway it sends a response down the peripheral nervous system uh, to the central nervous system where it gets it hits a spot like for instance the spinal cord um, and the lower end of the spinal cord because it's your leg and then the spinal cord sends a response back down the peripheral nervous system, except a different part of the peripheral nervous system. They're, um, they're motor nerves, and they cause the motor nerves to fire, twitching the muscle, causing your leg to extend. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is even though it touches your, ner your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spine, it only really interacts with a part of your spine. Your brain has no part of this process. They, they bang that that uh, that nerve in your knee and your leg extends and it's never something that you're consciously you consciously think to do um, at least it shouldn't be 
Um, so there is that as well. Uh, it's there. There's a fair amount of the nervous system which happens sort of. You can almost kind of think of it as autonomously from your brain. Um, it happens without input from your brain, which is kind of an interesting thing. So I mean, that's just the nervous system doing its job. But anyway. Now, neurons are basically the individual units of the nervous system. So, you know, if you've heard the term neurons, you probably think about neurons in your brain. But neurons refer to the individual cells, the nerve cells um, that exist in the nervous system. So it's not just the stuff in your brain. It's also the, the stuff in your knees and the stuff in the, you know, in your arms and your fingertips and your, in your, um, running all the way down your spine, you know, uh, like all around your skin in various places. Uh, neurons are, are nerve endings, essentially, among other things. They're, they're also, they're also the, the uh, you know, power lines that run from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. They make up all of that stuff. So, you know, just so you know, um, neurons are not limited to just being in your brain. But they are cells that are specialized for carrying signals. Sorry, I'm trying to get my cat from knocking things off the table, apparently. He's bored, and I can't exactly pay attention to him right now, so he's just kind of being whiny and petulant. Here, why don't you go in there? Go hang out inside of the desk. No? No? Excuse me. There you go. There you go. Oh, cats. Now, nerve signals in their transmission. Um, nerve function depends on charge differences across neuron membranes. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that uh, um, <clears throat> a, a neuron depends upon electrical currents in order to fire. And when I say fire, that works both ways. So it's either, it's either the sensory neuron is sending a signal through the periphery nerv peripheral nervous system to, you know, the, the brain or the spinal cord, um, or it's a signal being sent back to the motor neurons causing the muscles to pump. Uh, all of that is dependent upon an electrical current. It's a change in electrical charge moving along those neurons, which is the tran like it's what the transmission of signals are. So, um, each neuron has basically a, a sort of skin to it, a membrane, um, and it's got an amount of potential energy to it. Um, that is to say that there is the possibility for the electrical charge to change on that membrane. Um, you know, some things are very good at insulating against uh, electrical change. Neurons are not those things because it's, their entire job is to transmit things properly. Um, but um, part of the part of the way it does this is by um, utilizing ions, basically small individual atoms of elements um, that have an extra proton or an extra electron. Uh, so that they have an electrical charge to them. Uh, so, you know, that allows, um, that allows an electrical sort of potential to be built up along the outside of the neuron versus the inside. It's, the tricky thing about this is this is very much diving into the deep end of how, um, the nervous system works. And so this might be using information that maybe you've never even heard of before. It might require a, a baseline of knowledge that, that you guys haven't covered in school yet, um, which is fine. Um, I just want to, you know, let you know that there might be some stuff here that doesn't make any like much sense right now. If it does later, or if it does to you now, 
then fantastic. But if not, don't sweat it. Well, basically, you've got you've got potassium and sodium. That's what K and Na are. K is potassium, and Na is sodium. And these are these are potassium and sodium ions. So they have an extra proton because they're positive ions. And along the membrane, there are channels in which sodium can travel, and channels which potassium can travel along, and channels which either sodium or potassium can travel along. Um, the ones that are one way uh, and are really only for in like one or the other as opposed to both, those more or less work off of just um, the way those channels are shaped and their, their sort of electrical potential. Uh, the pumps actually require ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. That's the, that's the fuel that cells use. That's what you're, like when you eat food, you need, you, you know, you need to eat food for energy. Um, the food is broken down into its component parts, you know, fibers and sugars and things like that, and proteins and fats. And then those are broken down by the body into ATP, which is, is like gasoline for your cells. Um, everything that your cells do requires ATP to function. Um, now, you know, there's other stuff that your body uses. It uses the minerals and things like that in order to uh, do some things that, that ATP doesn't utilize. But regardless, um, that is, you know, you can think of it like gasoline. So you've got some, some natural sort of pumps for sodium and potassium. That only work one way. And then when you need to, like, when you need to get rid of something in a in a direction that it doesn't normally go, you can your cells will use these sodium potassium pumps, and they'll they'll use ATP in order to to sort of equalize everything. You can think of it like um. Uh, let's see here. You can think of it like a like a a cistern or something like that, or a, or a a tank for water, and there might be something that allows water to flow in, like maybe maybe a runoff from rains and stuff like that allow the water to flow in. But at some point, you know, the water gets too high, and so you want to make sure that, that water is removed from the tank. So you'll have a pump which pumps that water out of the tank and, you know, somewhere else, whether it's down a hill or whatever. Um, you can think of that, that sodium-potassium pump as that water pump, and then just the normal channels that sodium and potassium travel down being like the channels that run rainwater into this tank. So a nerve signal begins to change as a change in the membrane potential. Basically that electrical difference that exists on the membrane. Um, Stimulus is any factor that causes a nerve signal to be generated. So, you know, hearing a noise, smelling a smell, uh, seeing a thing, whatever. Uh, although that, that tends to happen more, the seeing the thing happens more in the, um, in the actual brain, but it's the same, it's the same basic idea. So a nerve signal is called an action potential. But basically what happens here is on the inside, um, this is basically just the resting state. So you've got um, the the sodium and potassium channels. These things here are completely closed. Um, so you know you there's no electrical difference. And then you might see a thing or hear a thing or something might touch you, and so that hits your that hits your uh, sensory neurons and it causes some of the uh, sodium channels to open up. If enough open up, or if enough sodium gets in, then it causes basically like a chain reaction. Uh, and then it, it starts, you know, it starts this chain reaction in that particular neuron, then moves it down subsequent neurons, which allows that, um, that st stimulus to travel, basically that, that feeling that you have or the thing that you see. To, to travel down the central or down the nervous system, whether it's the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system, to be processed and then a response sent back out. Um, but basically, 
Yeah, so the, the sodium channels open up, more sodium comes in, and that makes the inside of the membrane more positive than the outside, which means that the uh, basically things start to equal out. The sodium channels close, and the potassium channels open, and then potassium gets pumped out of the cell. Um, and uh, they close much more slowly than the sodium channels do. So the sodium channels fill up and basically create a big positive, or at least some positive, and then they just like wrench closed, and then the, the potassium channels open up, and the potassium starts flowing out because the inside of it is very positive now, right? And uh, opposites attract and likes repel in magnetism and electricity. So now that there's a whole bunch of positive inside of the cell, it needs to get rid of a whole bunch of positive in order to equalize. And then the negative on the outside wants positive in order to equalize. So this positive potassium starts shooting out of these potassium channels. But the potassium channels close kind of slowly. So in the end, um, the uh, the inside of the cell becomes a little bit more negative than the outside of the cell, which is exactly um, the same as it is in its resting state. Again, this potential um, this potential electrical energy that exists, the inside of the cell is always slightly more negative than the outside of the cell, and that's how it equalizes itself is because the potassium part closes relatively slowly, allowing more potassium to get out than it allowed sodium in. Again, there's a lot going on here, so don't sweat it. So here's an idea of how this sort of reaction can travel down um, a neuron or an axon, I guess, to another neuron. Um, so it allows the it allows the um, the sodium in, causing the inside of this particular membrane, uh, part of the membrane, to be positive and the outside to be negative. It flows outwards as well because there is area there are areas on the inside uh, which will also attract it. Um, as it equalizes, it sends out potassium um, and forces the area up here to be a little bit more negative, or excuse me, more positive. So these will open up and send in sodium, and then they'll start sending out potassium, which, is force, which forces these to open up and send in sodium, and so on and so forth. And so by doing that, it travels down um, neurons. Uh, so yeah, action potentials are self-propagated in a one-way train, chain, train reaction, chain reaction along a neuron, and all or none events. So you don't get kind of a response. You either get a response or you don't. Um, it's very much a binary thing. Remembering back to our terms of binary versus analog, uh, it is very much a binary thing. It's either enough to cause a reaction or it's not, and then that reaction propagates with the same strength. So you know you you don't like kind of get like a, oh, I got kind of a response. Even though sometimes you feel like you can feel different levels of pain and stuff like that, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that of like how many nerves are firing and things like that, but anyway. Um, the frequency of action potentials, but not their strength, changes with the strength of the stimulus. See, there you go. Um, if you feel more pain, it's because you're, or if you if you hear something louder, or you smell something stronger, it's because there are more signals being sent more quickly down that particular part of your nervous system. It's not going to be a stronger signal. You're not going to get more electrical current being sent down that, um, that, uh, that nervous system path. It's going to be you're going to have more frequent responses on there. Now synapses are junctions where the signals are transmitted. So basically they're where axons connect to the dendrites on individual neurons. Going back to this picture, here is an entire neuron. A neuron has a dendrite, which is this ball part with all the little branches on it, and then it has an axon, which is the tail that has the little branches on the end of the tail. So dendrite, axon, make up a neuron. 
Now, synapses are where axons of one neuron connect to the dendrite of another neuron. The tail connects to the ball of another neuron. Um, and basically, the interesting thing about synapses is they don't like they don't really touch. However, they still they're close enough that they can influence one another. So um, here we'll have you know these sort of individual um, pockets holding uh, whether they be chemicals uh, for you know like like um, uh, hormones or or, or or ions or whatever, um, you get the electrical current traveling down, which forces these these vesicles to hit the end here. They'll um, basically open up and release transmitters. They're called neurotransmitters, and they can be any number of things that influence how you feel about something. They influence how your nervous system reacts to specific things. Uh, neurotransmitters, uh, they can be um, endorphins. Um, endorphins are actually a very you know, big neurotransmitter. Um, so if you've ever felt happy, happy you can thank endorphins for that. Um, there, are, there are neurotransmitters for feeling calm. There are neurotransmitters for feeling nervous, um, for feeling just all kinds of different things. And a lot of times they're just a combination of a few different of them, uh, which help create these complex feelings in people. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's this synaptic cleft here, which is exactly what I'm referring to. There's there's a there's synapses. The individual neurons don't actually touch each other. They're just close enough to allow these neurotransmitters to hit the uh, neurotransmitter receivers receptors and influence the action that exists that, that happens on that uh, neuron. So, you know, if you've ever been super happy about something, all those neurons in your brain, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're very close together and those synapses are firing off endorphins. Um, they're not actually touching, but those endorphins are floating close enough to the next neuron that the neuron's little uh, receptors open up and just accept those endorphins and it's the, the feeling sort of spreads throughout your brain. You know, like it happens. It's also important to note that neurotransmitters don't actually go through these receptors, or excuse me, the, the, um, the channels. The receptors are little things that exist on the side of the channels that force the channel open or closed. A lot of times they force the channel open. Um, by forcing the channel open, they allow sodium or potassium to get in, which then influences the action on that synapse. Is this getting weird yet? Because it's pretty weird to think about. So yeah, as far as neurotransmitters are concerned, basically these small things that either that attach to a channel, either they'll force a channel open, excited receiving cell, may, meaning that it makes the, the ion channel open, allowing ions in. Others uh, inhibit a receiving cell activity, which basically means that it makes sure those channels stay closed or they don't open up as much, which means they don't take in as many ions which means that this whole thing about like the the electrical potential changing along uh, a neuron is sort of dampened down, um, which inhibits action potentials. These things where the electrical current travels down the um, the uh, axon. still possible that you'll run into it, but it decreases its ability to develop action potentials. Now, the combination, or the summation, the, 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 the total amount of excitation and inhibition 
uh, neurotransmitters determines if a neuron will transmit a nerve signal. So you might have uh, like you might have a neurotransmitter which is trying to force ion channels open and another one which is trying to force ion channels closed. And whichever one basically there's more of will win out and if it's enough, it will force either the, the neuron to transmit an action potential, that is that electrical current, or not. So neurons are super creepy looking. And I lied, dendrites are actually just the branches on the uh, on the actual neuron itself. The neuron is, is the cell in the middle. It's got a tail and it's got branches. So you've got the cell body, you've got the, the branches, and you've got the tail. The cell body is the cell body. The uh, branches are the dendrites and the tail is the axon. But yeah, so that is... Um, a very basic overview of kind of how the central nervous system communicates. So you can think of think of this stuff like uh, let's see here. Here we go. You're at a stadium. And how many of you have been to like a sports game at the stadium at a stadium and um, somebody tries to do the wave? All right. We've got like one person. How many of you know what I'm referring to when I say the wave? Okay. Pretty much everybody. All right. So you can think of, because like the wave is entirely dependent upon the next person continuing the wave, right? Like you stand up and raise your hands. And if the person next to you does not stand up and raise their hands, then the wave dies there which sounds really dramatic, but basically, um, you, you know, the, the wave doesn't continue. Um, think of that as how, like, the electrical signal travels down uh, a set of neurons. Each of you are neurons. And the air in between you and the next person is like the synapse, you know, because you're not actually touching each other, or you and the next person, each each, each one represents a synapse because you're not actually touching each other. However, you know, you could be like really into it and be like, yeah, like, come on, let's do the wave. And that could be thought of as like those excited neurotransmitters that are encouraging these ion channels to open up and send a re like a response down the next neuron. So they'll be like, yeah, this guy's super stoked about doing the wave. I'm going to do it too. And so they'll stand up and go like this. Or maybe, you know, they're, they're like a huge party pooper, and they're just kind of like, oh, this is so dumb. Why would we do this? Anybody who does this is dumb. And then the person next to them is going to kind of be like, hey, I don't really want to be judged by this person. So, and nobody really seems to be enjoying it because maybe all they can see is this guy. And they go like, I'm not going to do the wave. And so that's an inhibition neurotransmitter. Um, it's making the other person less likely to do the wave. Um, now again, the summation of excitation and inhibition neurotransmitters determines whether a neuron will transmit a nerve signal. So if they see that one guy going, this is dumb, but everybody else is like, yeah, then they'll do it too. You know, like that guy's just a party pooper, whatever. But if most everybody's like, this is really dumb, and there's one dude over there who's like way too excited about doing the wave, they're probably going to be like, I don't want to be like that guy. So I'm not going to. Now, an overview of animal nervous systems. So... Nervous systems vary greatly. They are uh, the earliest 
um, sort of forms of life had incredibly simple nervous systems. Um, but as uh, life has gotten more complex, so have their nervous systems. Um, So it's it, all, the, all the way up to basically vertebrates. Um, vertebrates have some of the most complex brains out of uh, any form of life, just because they have that secondary, um, that secondary peripheral nervous system in the, uh, well, I mean, it's still considered the central nervous system, but the helper that is the spinal column, the spinal cord. Um, Now, let's just take a look at simple things first. So, radially symmetrical animals like worms and, and stuff like that um, have a nervous system arranged in a web-like system of neurons called a nerve net. So, uh, they're just sort of everywhere. There's no centralized kind of um, set of... Uh, of nerves, they're they're just they they grow evenly everywhere, but there's no there's no denser concentration of nerves like you have with, for instance, vertebrates. Um, but most bilaterally symmetrical animals evolved cephalization and centralization. Uh, cephalization, I'm not entirely sure of, but centralization, I'm very familiar with. Um, Basically, all of the nerves are more centralized in a given area. So, you know, you have uh, leeches here. They've got this set of um, set of nerves all the way down the middle, which kind of reach outwards a little bit. And there's a small brain at the top. Uh, flatworms, again, have a cluster of nerves around their eyes, but otherwise they're, you know, they've got a central sort of line of nerves uh, that that sort of carry information throughout their body. Uh, insects have a brain, which is just a large cluster of nerves, um, and a set of, you know, like a sort of a line of nerves, like a, almost like a, like a, like a spinal cord, but, you know, not to that extent. And then peripheral nerves. And squid pretty big brain pretty big cluster of nerves there and uh large sets of nerves along the uh you know the head and, and then some in each uh of the tentacles that sort of thing now obviously this is not a one-to-one -one drawing this is more just a representation of the um how how many nerves there are very related like uh in relation to the rest of the body so it's not like a, a bug just has one single string of neurons, um, one nerve cord running along its leg. It's probably going to have a few. Likewise with a, um, it's just going to be less dense than the rest of its body. Now, vertebrate nervous systems, nervous nervous systems like humans and cats and dogs and anything with a spine, that's what vertebrate refers to is it has a spine. Uh, vertebrate nervous systems are highly centralized. So in the vertebrates, uh, the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and the vertebrate peripheral nervous system consists of cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and ganglia. Ganglia, what a name. Um, so yeah, like the central nervous system is going to be the brain and the spinal cord, uh, and then the peripheral nervous system is going to be like the 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 nerves that run off of that elsewhere into the body, as well as nerves in the brain and things like that. But there are very large clusters of nerves uh, <laughs> in vertebrates on the spinal cord, and then the brain is a very large cluster of neurons. The peripheral nervous system of vertebrates is a functional hierarchy. So the motor nervous system carries signals to and from skeletal muscles. So you get like a call and response thing from them. And the autonomic nervous system regulates the internal environments. The autonomic nervous system is like, you know, your heart beating and, and your, your breathing patterns and, and um, 
you know, various things that your body does on the inside that are weird and creepy to think about. Um, stuff like that. So the peripheral nervous system is what carries stuff to and from the central nervous system. The motor system is, you know, moving and, and doing stuff like that, like me doing all these wild gesticulations while I'm talking, though you can't see it. Uh, the autonomic nervous system is, um, you know, fight or flight response. Um, and the opposite of that, which is known as rest and digest, um, basically where it, it regulates sort of the, the blood flow to different parts of your body and, and the, um, the, the flow of adrenaline and stuff like that. And then there is the actual like digestion part, which is all part of the, uh, the autonomic nervous system. Like it does all the stuff like releases like the acids and the, 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 um, uh, other sort of, uh, chemical concoctions that your body uses in order to break food down into stuff that you can, you know, process for energy and, you know, it makes the muscles move food elsewhere in your digestive system and weird stuff like that. So the autonomic nervous system is composed of three divisions, the parasympathetic division, the sympathetic division, and the enteric division. The parasympathetic division is going to be, um, well, like that, that rest and digest stuff. So it will, you know, slow things down and sort of preserve body energy and things like that. Um, it encourages, you know, paying attention to hunger and digesting and things like that. Whereas the sympathetic, um, as you can see here under the parasympathetic, it's listed as constricts people and then sympathetic as dilates people. Um, that's the body's response to danger. Um, so as we can see here in the parasympathetic, it constricts the pupil and simulates saliva secretion. So, you know, like mouth watering to response to food and stuff like that. Um, constricts bronchi, slows heart, stimulates stomach, pancreas, and intestines, simul stimulates urination. Um, whereas with the sympathetic division, dilates people. So now suddenly, you know, you're seeing things much more sharply and clearly. It inhibits saliva secretion because now is not the time to eat. It relaxes bronchi. It makes them larger. So now you're, you're processing more oxygen with each breath. It accelerates heart. So now you're ready to you know, go running or something like that. It stimulates the adrenal gland. Um, it sort of stops the digestive system from doing its thing as much. Um, so that's part of the reason why, you know, people can feel kind of nauseous when they're, when they're really worried, uh, is if they have food sitting in their system, their body can be like, now is not the time to process this. We need to get rid of this kind of a thing. It's interesting. And all that stuff, you know, happens completely subconsciously. Like it happens without your voluntary decision, you know, like you don't go like, okay, now is the time to freak out. Although you think, you know, in the, after the fact, you might think like, okay, now is the time for action or whatever, but it's something that your body automatically does as soon as you encounter either danger or, you know, it's past. Um, so now we move on to the human brain, the structure of a living supercomputer, the human brain, the midbrain subdivisions of the hindbrain, the thalamus and the hypothalamus do a lot of stuff. Um, conduct information to and from higher brain centers. They regulate homeostatic functions. They keep track of the body position, the body's position, and sort sensory information. So they're sort of like the, um, the, the lower conscious part of the minds, uh, of the mind, excuse me. Um, the frontal lobe is generally what people think of when they think of how like humans can think and stuff like that. A lot of that kind of stuff happens in the frontal lobe and sort of scattered here and there throughout the brain. But, um, these these areas, the midbrain, the hindbrain, uh, thalamus, and the hypothalamus, not all the hindbrain, uh, they do a lot of the autonomic stuff, um, but like not quite base level, but sort of the stuff that gets passed to your to your conscious brain, so that you're at least peripherally aware of it. So conduct information to and from higher brain centers. So that's where you become, you know conscious of the fact that something's happening, like, oh, hey, my stomach hurts. You can, th you can thank some of these areas uh, for passing information to your, to your uh, you know, to your higher brain. So you can go, my stomach hurts. I must have eaten something bad, you know, and you can start rationalizing it and things like that. 
before that, your body's aware of the fact that your stomach hurts and it's already doing, you know, nervous system responses to it. But it's not until it gets to your higher brain where you go like, oh man, like maybe I shouldn't have had, I don't know, whatever, like th that pizza or something. Regulate homeostatic functions has to do with how your body, you know, sort of regulates itself, including its internal temperature and stuff like that. So when you get really cold, um, if your body temperature starts to drop, you'll actually notice that your your hands and arms and feet and legs and stuff like that get colder. It's because it's actually constricting those blood vessels in those areas and bringing more blood to the core in order to keep the core of your body warmer, because that's the more important part, and your head too. Um, and it tries to keep most of the heat around the core. So if you start getting really cold, that's where the danger of frostbite comes in and stuff like that is because those blood vessels get constricted um, and there's not as much blood that gets there. They cool down to a point where the tissue starts to die and it's not getting blood and the, the, the vessels stay closed so it doesn't really get blood there either. That's a, that's a very, very side note. But it's kind of an example of something that the, the homeostasis um, sort of drive can do in your body. Um, keep track of body position. So if you're aware of the fact that you're sitting or how you're sitting or whether or not you're standing at a, like an angle or, you know, whatever, uh, and sort sensory information is to make sense of all the stuff that you're taking in at all times. So like what your eyes are processing, what your ears are hearing, what, you know, what your nose is smelling, what your body is feeling right now, and sort of bring important stuff to your conscious mind's attention. Um, you know, there and, 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 and also assemble a picture for your conscious mind to process and stuff like that. Um, there's actually a lot of stuff that goes on in your sort of lower conscious kind of area, you know, the, these areas that, um, that your conscious mind isn't even aware of. And it's pretty incredible. Um, if you're ever interested in, in the mind, it, it's, it's just, it, it's an amazing thing how much processing and information goes through your brain before you're even aware of it happening. Um, Like the, for instance, it takes a fraction of a second longer. Like we're talking a very minute fraction of a second, but it takes a fraction of a second longer for you to process visual information than it does for you to process auditory information because there are fewer um, sort of nerves associated with the ear uh, than there are with the eye. Because of that, your brain actually processes the auditory information and then kind of holds it in your, in, you know, in, in the midbrain or in the, you know, in the, some part of the hindbrain, it holds it there and just doesn't tell your conscious mind about it until you're done processing the visual aspect. And then it gives it both to you at the same time. So the sounds match up with what you see. So you're actually aware of hearing things before, excuse me, you're aware of hearing things at the same time that you see them, but your brain actually has already processed those sounds before it's actually processed visual. It just, it just sort of syncs them together. You're actually seeing things as they're coming in and hearing things a moment before you're aware that you're hearing them. And that's why sometimes maybe it feels like you react to things before you hear them because people have reported that kind of thing before. Like they, they, thought they jumped the gun at a race or something like that because they reacted to it before they heard it. And uh, in reality, a subconscious part of the brain actually heard it, processed it, and went like, hey, we should do something about this. And it initiated a nervous system response before the conscious brain was even aware of it. Pretty crazy, right? Anyway, we're going to start getting more into this brain stuff um, next Monday and going over that kind of stuff. And um, for now, though, we'll, we'll turn it into question and answer time as well as poll question time. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll break for the weekend. So here we go. First poll question.